special thank you again to our, our four panelists who are here to discuss a very crucial topic and, and a big topic. Um, so when I was speaking to Ambassador Zazare um, about the idea and Ambassador Wheeler, um, Ambassador Zazare said, Scott, why don't you just come up here before to get the ball rolling and mention some things about foreign policy in, in general in, in South Africa. So that's what I just want to briefly do. But just to discuss the, the structure of the talk, uh, we're basically, if you've seen the program, we're going to go in chronological order. Uh, talking, starting with the transition, and uh, going through the Mandela and Mbeki administrations, then obviously ending up with uh, talking about the Zuma administrations, and then also the impacts on the industry and the sort of future of South African foreign policy. So when I was uh, thinking of talking about South African foreign policy, I was trying to sort of get in a sense or sort of narrow it down to, to two words. Um, I've been doing research on the topic for probably about five or six years now. And the two words that sort of kept coming up in my mind was, uh, number one was perception. And I think this is why this, this, event, this uh, event is so important. You know, it's a practitioner's perspective. Because often when you read the media and you hear things about uh, South Africa's votes in the UN or South Africa in Zimbabwe, it's, uh, it's sort of just the, the top foam when you think about a cup of coffee. It's the, the, but behind it, there's a lot of things that go on behind the scenes that most people are not familiar with. And that has a big role in, on a UN vote or on a certain decision that was made. And uh, often we don't get to that meat. So some people have the perception that, uh, uh, that the foreign policy is going off, off sway or, or there's something wrong with it. But often that's not the case. So I'm hoping that the, the four panelists will be able to, uh, to talk about some of these behind the scene issues and the, and the current issues. Um, with perception, I think, uh, especially from the West, uh, when the ANC came into power in 1994, there was a big perception that South African foreign policy was going to be this sort of beacon for, for human rights. And, and Mandela even wrote that in his expose in Foreign Affairs. It was one of the pillars in the, the foreign policy documents. And then going on you know, a few years later, uh, there was events that occurred that uh, various countries were saying, OK, what's, uh, you know, they were contemplating if this was still the case because of relations with certain countries like Iran and, and Libya and, and various others. Um, so perception uh, is a big point so that I hope that we can talk about today. Uh, also, sticking with perception, uh, we often have talks, especially in, in this day and age, with business leaders about South Africa's role in Africa itself. You know, people describe South Africa as this sort of island, and um, they've been very good in the foreign policy about promoting African interests. And uh, almost every time you hear a South African diplomat or minister talk, they talk about promoting the Africa agenda, which is which is great. Uh, but if you think, if you turn it around and you look at the perception from other African countries, uh, like Nigeria, for example, they don't sort of share that same view. And sometimes when they see South Africa's addition to BRICS, which was a huge political achievement for, for, um, for President Zuma's administration, uh, they see that South Africa is trying to promote their own interests and has nothing to do with Africa. So um, again, so again, perception is, is quite key. And the second word when I was thinking about foreign policy was, was disconnect. And what I mean by, by disconnect was, um, is number one, it, it's within Durko and within other administrations. We had uh, a speaker come last month, Carol O'Brien from our field. She was the executive director, well, she is the executive director of the American Chamber of Commerce. And she was at great, gave a great speech about how important foreign direct investment is to South African countries you know, in general. And, uh, but then she went on to give an example of a, a sort of head of a, a very big American car company, without naming names, who was basically asked to sort of be departed because he, his visa wasn't going to be renewed, even though he's worked with this company for, for 30 years. Um, and I thought that, well, that was quite strange because I know Jerko, the ambassadors, will probably talk better about this than, than I can, but one of their big roles now is if you're an ambassador to a country from South Africa, you're trying to attract business to, to come operate in South Africa and get the economic and foreign investment. Um, so they're trying to do that and bring in companies like Walmart, uh, but then the people on the ground actually are having trouble getting visas. There seems to be this disconnect between, between Home Affairs and, and Durka. So again, this is more just food for thought for maybe discussion for Q&A later. Uh, also, when I was thinking about the, the word disconnect, also in, uh, thinking about um, within Durko itself, there's an interesting uh, WikiLeaks cable that I know the guys from American Embassy probably do not want to hear the word WikiLeaks, that's for sure. But uh, there was a cable that came out in 2010 that I thought was quite interesting, talking about the disconnect within Durko itself and then how this could have a role. So I just want to quickly read something um, from, that, from that cable. 
It was between a meeting between American Embassy personnel and the Jerko Chief Director of Human Rights and Humanitarian Affairs, Pizzo Montuedi, on human rights abuses in, Ir in Iran. The uh, Chief Director did obviously stress that uh, South Africa has a big concern with human rights in Iran, and that's, that's definitely the case. However, and I quote, he complained that his department is rudderless since the change of the administration. He lamented that the Minister of Durgo, Mashabani, is always out of the country and has not clearly um, delineated portfolios for the two deputy ministers, so there's no coherence in policy formulation. So this is what I was talking about before in the media. We don't sort of get this, this aspect, and even though Wikipedia was a, an issue for the U.S. government, it did allow academics like myself doing research and media to, to, to get a sense and a feel of the stuff that the practitioners sort of deal with. And hopefully, again, we could talk about this. Uh, and then he went on to, uh, to basically say that, uh, and give other examples, and one was about the issue of not receiving instructions from, as an ambassador from, from Durko back in South Africa. And um, so basically, the, he didn't receive any instructions, and it said this was disastrous because, and I quote, saying nothing says something, and feels other nations would question whether South Africa is withdrawing from human rights conversations altogether or giving Iran implicit support. So again, it's sort of important, uh, important background information. But all that said, all that sort of um, criticism, uh, but we have to give South Africa credit. It's a very young democracy that had a huge sort of task in front of them with the transition, sort of re-engaging with, with the world. And again, it's only been 18 years, and especially at a, at a time when sort of globalization was really taking root and the importance of economics, international trade were, were growing and the growth of other developing countries. So they really have to put your sort of hands together for a lot of things that they've accomplished in, in various avenues. But uh, I'm not an expert, so I'm going to ask Ambassador Zazre, who play, uh, played a crucial role in the transition uh, from the apartheid government to the democratic government led by the ANC. So if we could just put our hands together for Ambassador Vic Zazre.